Hi, Ron. Welcome to the show. Hey, Ronnie. It's great to be here. So you've done quite a bit of research on the topic of emotions and how they relate to intergroup conflicts. And what better place to study that here in Israel? Now, I would love if you could give us a bit of background on how you became interested in this field, because I know that you have quite the story. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because it's, it's quite a story, but it's not such a unique story for people who are living in, in intergroup conflicts. So, you know, I was born and raised in Israel, uh, uh, you know, my, 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 in an environment in which everyone were part of the of this conflict and the conflict was very very present in in my house you know since i was since i remember myself um, i think that the major event that really you know led me to do what I, what i'm doing today was was when i was an officer in a special unit in in the israeli army at the idf it was 26 years ago i'm getting old on it <laughs> worried Uh, in 1997, I was uh, very seriously injured as part of my army service in, in Lebanon. Uh, as part of, you know, something that for me was kind of, you know, a major event in, in my life. But when I look around me on, you know, Palestinians, other Arabs in the area, uh, Jewish Israelis, not a very unique event. I was, I was injured. I, I was hospitalized for, for a very long time. Like I was... Uh, Three, three months in, 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 in hospital and then almost three years in rehabilitation center. Uh, I was seriously injured in both of my hands. Both of my hands didn't function for, for almost this entire time, for almost three years. It's kind of, you know, if we talk about emotions and psychology, it's, it's kind of a, a, a very, very transformative like, like experience not to be Absolutely. able to do anything with your hands for almost three years. And, and, and for me, the most important thing that happened is that, you know, I had some time to think and, and, and go, you know, think in, in a way that is slightly different from the way I thought about this situation up until this point. I think that for many of us, you know, it's, it's very difficult to live in, in, in situation of conflict, but when, you, when, when you're born into it, You know, that's your life and you're getting used to it. And, you know, I, I, unfortunately, and it's a terrible thing to say, but, you know, for my kids, I have three kids. For my kids, the fact that once, once in a year, more or less, there are missiles that are shot around their, their home is, is, you know, that's life and it's okay. And they're, I think that they have quite a happy, you know, childhood. And it's terrible to say, really. I really think that it's a terrible thing to say. But for me... Back then in 1997, it led me to, 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 to tell myself or to think for myself that, you know, we cannot accept this situation as, as you know, as, you know, that's like a God-given situation. And that, that's the only way we can live our life, our life. And, and I have to do something to maybe stimulate a different way of thinking about what's happening to us. And I didn't really know what should be done, but it was very, very, it was very clear to me, you know, that we try to do the same things every time. And the same things meaning, you know, offering new solutions, you know, let's put the border here or make these political compromises or offer this a, a new agreement or new, and, 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 and it doesn't work. And, and, and for me, it led me to believe that maybe the problem is totally in a different area. And, you know, fast forward 20 something years later, I'm quite convinced right now that, you know, the, the problems are political problems. You will never hear from me that everything is emotional. It's not that everything is emotional. If you think about Israelis or, and Palestinians, or if you think about any other violent conflict around the world, the problems are real, tangible, disagreements or ideological disagreements between different parties. Israelis and Palestinians, they don't fight over, you know, mistrust, fear, and hatred. They fight over the land. They fight over Jerusalem. They fight over the question of the refugees. But, but I think that the main reason why this is so hard for them to address these real issues are psychological reasons. 
And that's why I believe that, you know, we call it psychological barriers or emotional barriers. And the idea of emotional barriers or psychological barriers, you know, in a very simple way is that in order for us to deal with the real issues, we first have to remove or address the psychological or the emotional processes that prevent us from seriously or rationally dealing with the real issues. So for me, I think that the most transformative thing that happened to me 26 years ago is that I realized that we have to think about these things differently. It's not about the real issues. It's more about our emotions, our thoughts, our perceptions about the situations. And only once we'll be able to deal with these emotions, then we can maybe talk about the, the you know, the, what people talk about is the real issues. I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, when I hear political discussions, whether they're on the news or around the dinner table, I think that this is always a missing ingredient. And, you know, as you said, there are tangible, real, concrete political issues and incentives and economic uh, issues, but these psychological and emotional barriers and understanding how they cloud our judgment. You know, we want to reach a rational understanding of the situation. And when we're blinded by these things, and when we vote for leaders, you know, without any rational regard for what they actually bring to the table and whether they actually are in our best interest or not, emotions are definitely at play here. So I love, you know, the direction of your research, and I think it's so important. And I want to, uh, in your book, Emotions in Conflict, you lay out five assumptions at the beginning of the book that I think are really helpful to kind of, you know, give a general context for what we're talking about here when we're saying emotions and intergroup conflicts. So I'll read them out to you one by one. And if you could just explain to us what they mean and how we should think about them. So first assumption, emotions do not operate in a vacuum. And hence, studying emotional processes and in intractable conflicts should be different than studying emotions in other domains of life. So there's a lot there. First of all, what are intractable conflicts and why should we think about emotions differently when we're looking at them in these kinds of contexts? So, so, so I think that there are, there are two parts to this, to this very basic assumption. And one part is, is, is more generic. I would say, you know, for many, many years, we used to think of emotions as almost like an intrapersonal phenomenon. Right. You know, it's such a it's part of our like secret mental, psychological, like, 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 like personalities. Right. And, 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 and this and I think that this is this is really wrong. I think that, you know, we cannot think about emotions without taking into account the context. And, and this is true not only for intractable conflict. It's true for everything. Because, you know, I, I'll give you the most simple, the most simple like, like example. So, so you and I can experience the very, very same event and respond to it emotionally very, very differently. Very differently, right? And we'll respond to it emotionally very differently because we have different backgrounds, because we have different prior experiences, because we appraise the situation very, very differently, and because we have different beliefs about our, our abilities, you know, to respond to this specific situation. So. So emotions, so, so, the, so, so you have to take into account the context in order to even think about emotions. And intractable conflicts are just, you know, they're a very, very unique context. So if people have been living in a situation for so many years in which, you know, they live in a constant threat, they live in a constant belief that, you know, nothing good can happen here. They know that they will have to sacrifice their life and their life, the life maybe of their kids, their friends, their family members for the interest of the conflict. I would like to argue that their entire, you know, emotional map or emotional spectrum would be different from the one who maybe would experience the same emotion in, in a different situation. 
So that's that's one aspect. The second aspect is that you know experiencing emotion in and, and I'm sure that we'll talk about collective emotion or emotional climate later on. But but experiencing emotions in a situation in which many many people around you are experiencing more or less the same you know emotional intensity emotional valence is very very different from experiencing emotions in isolation from the society and it has many many implications but when you think about societies in conflict i think that one of the most amazing thing that is happening there is that people experience emotions simultaneously in you know synchronization with many many other people and this makes the whole emotional reaction and regulation quite different than, than in other contexts okay so the second assumption goes like this emotions are powerful engines of human behavior and they are even more powerful in social contexts and may be most powerful in a conflictual social context So how are they engines of human behavior? And why are they so powerful when we're dealing with conflict? So, so, so I think that, at least for me, the most, you know, uh, um, the, the more important part of this assumption is the first part. So right. At the end of the day, we're, you know, we're driven by our emotions. So there are many things that are, are important when, when, you know, when, when, when you try to analyze why do people operate or behave in one, one way or, or another. So their, you know, their values, their beliefs, their prior experiences, their personalities. I would like to suggest that all of these things together, you know, are driving their emotions. And emotions are like the mechanism that then drives the action. So, you know, think about your values. You have many, many, many different like, like, like values, but values do not motivate you for action directly. Values would motivate you to action when they are translated to emotions. Think about it. And, 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 and emotions are the, the most important thing about emotion. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, let, let's think, let, let, let's, take, let's take an example. Um, you know, I think that something is really, really wrong. Okay, I think that you did something really wrong to me, okay, and that it's not fair and that you shouldn't behave this way. As long as it's only my belief that is based on my like values or norms, I, I, can, I can feel really bad about that, but it won't really make me or drive me to action. I'll do something only if it will make me really angry. Because anger is the, that's one specific example for an emotion that takes these, you know, these values and beliefs and, 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 and perceptions about the reality and translate it into action. Because, because, because anger is not just about the fact that you did something wrong to me. It's combining the fact that I believe that you did something wrong and unfair to me with my goal, or we call it emotional goal, of I want to correct this wrongdoing. I want to, you know, somehow correct this unfair immoral behavior or, or action that, that you did. So emotions are really the driving force of, 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 of everything that we believe in, think about, and, 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 and think about in life. I agree completely. And I think that a lot of times, you know, we th like to think of ourselves as rational beings and, you know, we're above our emotions. But I think that's the most dangerous situation to be in when we're not aware of our emotions and how they're driving us. And but, I think but, it's, yeah, yeah. Let, let me challenge you on that. I mean, you, okay. you, you're saying it for the second time, like this distinction between emotions and, and being rational and being emotional. Right, and right, I right. I, I don't see this distinction as such, such clear-cut distinction. I, I think that I, you know, if I think that you did something, let's take the same example. Sure, sure. If, if I think that you did something really, really wrong to me or to my friends, okay, and that it's unfair and you shouldn't behave this way, and I believe that I have enough agency or control and I can do something to correct the wrongdoing, and then I, I don't know what, I yell at you or even hit you in the face, okay, <laughs> in order to correct this wrongdoing, that's a very, very rational response. That's a very rational response. The emotions are only translating 
my appraisal of the situation and you know driving the action that can adaptively most of the time but sometimes not not so adaptively respond to, to this situation i don't think that it's irrational often then that's a rational response i completely agree and you know i think that in terms of emotions being adaptive and guiding us and you know offering very important useful information in whatever context we're in I'm with you there. I'm speaking to the people who think that they're purely logical beings who are, you know, divorced from emotions and that they can operate in that kind of sphere because I think that then there's just a misunderstanding of how emotions play and the fact that, you know, you're either aware of how your emotions are guiding you or you're not aware and they're controlling you. But either way, you know, we're we're humans and thinking, feeling, it, it's all intertwined. So I'm 100% with you there. I, I just said, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to say that some emotions can be really destructive, and I agree. Right. And also that some of them can make you feel really bad, okay? Uh, but so, so you want to regulate them or you want to change them, but it does not necessarily mean that they're irrational. Right, right, right. No, they're, they could be rational. They could be adaptive for the situation, uh, and I think I think respecting our emotions and understanding where they come from and understanding the function that they play is very important, mm -hmm. especially when we're looking at these wider contexts. So our third assumption here, we can study decision makers and leaders' emotions and decision making processes, but it is equally as important to study bottom up processes, namely the way emotions of the masses shape and operate to form leaders' decision-making? So, so, so I think that what, what I referred to here in this, in this assumption is, first of all, that you know, I truly believe in what I call bottom-up processes. Like at the end of the day, when we think about conflict, so you, know, you, you need two leaders to sign a peace agreement, or you need one leader to decide to go to war, or two leaders to decide to go to war. And then I think that there's, a, you know, there's, there's a, an ongoing debate, mainly in IR, in international relations, like literature, on whether it's like leaders make decisions and then people follow, or whether at the end of the day, leaders follow their masses. And I, I, I truly believe that, that, you know, probably the answer is that it go both ways. And you don't have to decide whether it's only top down or bottom up processes. But I do think that the emotions that are experienced by the masses are really, really powerful. And if we can understand and maybe also influence the way the masses feel, then we can also understand and also and, and alter the decisions that their leaders are making. Because if people are really, really angry, if, if you know, thousands and thousands of people are really, really angry, my assumption is that the leaders will have to respond to it somehow. And I believe that, uh, I'll just say maybe one, one last thing about, about that part, that especially when we talk about peace processes, it's very, very difficult for leaders to make this decision of, you know, and breaking into, into this like, like very, very risky situation or process of, 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 of peace process. If they, if they don't feel that they are supported or backed by their people. And, and I think that here, bottom-up processes are, are very, very important. And therefore, studying the emotions of the masses is even more important than studying the emotions of the leaders. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just to emphasize that point, the fact that, you know, a leader could want to make peace and their people can see that as a betrayal, you know, and see that as, um, you know, being a traitor almost. These emotions can really uh, be conflictual. And I think that some of the leaders that we've seen throughout history who were skilled at channeling the emotions of their people, whether it's, you know, utilizing existing emotions or cultivating emotions as they go, have you know, one, the loyalty, first of all, of their people, uh, and also com 
have, I think, blinded people from really seeing, you know, what's going on behind the scenes because they really are able to use those emotions. And, you know, we we have a few here and uh, we have a few in history. Yeah. Uh, enough examples. Yeah, but, but also, you know, maybe 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 it's important to emphasize here. Yeah. It's it's we're saying it as as at least partially as, as you know, expressing criticism over. Right. It could also be positive. But, but but there's something also very, very natural. You know, one of, right. one of the main characteristics of societies in conflict is that for many, many, many years, you have to mobilize society members to basically be willing to make the, the, the you know, the biggest, com- the biggest sacrifices for the sake of the conflict. So you really want people to believe that, you know, that's the only way they can live their life. Because the enemy is, you know, inhuman or something, and they want to destroy us, and 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 that's the only alternative we have is to deal with this in a way of, you know, fighting and sacrificing and being, you know, whatever. And then at one point in which you have you 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 identify this political opportunity to maybe promote peace, you want to transform everything and change their entire like mental mindset. I would say into a mindset of peace. And that's very, very challenging. And this is also why I think that we have to address people's emotions, to take them very, very seriously and ask ourselves, how do we make people who are, you know, educated and socialized to hatred and mistrust and fear for so many years to become hopeful and empathetic? And, 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 and that's a huge challenge, huge challenge. Absolutely. And we'll get into that, you know, later on in terms of the powerful emotions that are at the root of intergroup conflicts and what can be done in order to change them and to make peace. So we'll breeze through these last two assumptions and then we'll get into the different emotions. So our fourth assumption here, and we'll we'll get into this a little bit more heavily later on, each discrete intergroup emotion has a unique nature appraisals, emotional goals, and action tendencies. And as such, each discrete intergroup emotion leads to concrete political implications regarding conflict and conflict resolution dynamics. So what do you mean by unique nature and discrete here? So, you know, for many years, especially for people who studied like conflicts, there was a very clear distinction between, you know, we have positive emotions, we have negative emotions. What we, what we need to do in order to promote peace and maybe reduce violence and aggression is to promote positive emotions, all positive emotions, and reduce negative emotions as much as we can. So our goal is to decrease hatred, anger, contempt, humiliation, whatever, and increase as much as we can hope, empathy, pride, whatever. What we know and, 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 and it should be said that there, there are some disagreements. I'm coming from the tradition of a di- discrete emotion approach. And th- this tradition of discrete emotion approach basically says that, you know, each emotion has its own story. And its, own, its, its, its story is basically composed of unique appraisal of the situation, a very, very distinct, like, feeling or affect within our, our body, and then a specific emotional goal or motivation to act in, in the real world. And this discrete emotion approach is, is also telling us that each and every story has unique implications in life. And what it means is that two emotions that are from the same veil, so two very negative emotions, let's take fear and anger, okay? Both of them are considered negative. And in the traditional approach to emotions in conflict, you would have said, we need to, you know, decrease both of them in order to promote conflict resolution. But if each and every one of them has have has a different story, a different narrative, and different implications on the conflict, we need to have or to adopt a much more nuanced approach to the study and understanding of emotions. We need to understand why and in what way anger, as an example, is different from fear in terms of the implication, in terms of the story, in, per- in terms of the appraisal of the situation, and then address only the emotion that's relevant 
for the goal we want to achieve in, in, in the specific situation. And I think that we'll, we'll talk about it later when we'll talk about specific emotions, but one of our main contributions, I think, in, in, in the study of emotions in conflict in recent years is the idea of saying, you know, we're able to identify the unique role of each and every emotion and say, you know, this emotion would be more relevant in this situation, whereas that emotion would be more relevant in, in another context. Right, right. I do love this approach because I think that, you know, as you said, each emotion has a story to it and you can understand the narrative and the whole operating system that, you know, is organized around these discrete emotions. So we'll get into that in a bit. And maybe, our last, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. I'll add one more thing that I, I forgot. Sure, sure. Because it also means that sometimes emotions would have very surprising and counterintuitive effects. So, right. for example, if you understand deeply, I'll give an example, that, that fear at the end of the day is, is only driven by people's willingness to reduce the threat somehow. So if, if people who feel fear want to reduce the threat, if, if their emotional goals, goal is, is threat reduction, then threat reduction can be achieved both by very aggressive policies but also maybe by very conciliatory policies, right? And then fear is not necessarily a negative thing to a conflict because if fear can be induced in order to promote motivation among people to, you know, to support more conciliatory policies, then it can, it's, 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 a very, it's a very negative feeling, but a very positive emotion in the sense of what are the implications of fear in, in, in the situation of the conflict. And th therefore, what, what I'm trying to say is that we need to deeply understand the story or the narrative of each and every emotion in order to have the understanding of how can it be used in the context of conflict. I really like that distinction of, you know, zooming out and not looking at these emotions as only positive and negative and really understanding how they're adaptive, first of all, responses uh, to certain situations, and how they can be utilized uh, to make the positive change that we'd like to see. And on that note, the fifth assumption, emotions can be changed, and in this way, they can also change political processes. So you've seen that they can be changed in terms of emotion regulation and the interventions that you guys have done. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know I, I, I'm I'm definitely I cannot take credit uh, for you know bringing to the table the idea of emotion regulation. Emotion regulation has been studied in, in in psychology for so many years. My my good friend and mentor James Gross was probably the first one who introduced like an amazing model about of, of you know how can people change the you know the quality and the quantity of the of or the intensity of the emotion that they, they, they experience. I think that what, what we brought to the table in our research, which can be sound quite intuitive, is that, you know, if people can regulate their emotions in so many other domains in life, you know, if I will tell you that you can work on regulating your emotions in terms of your, I don't know, personal relationship or romantic relationship or working on regulating your emotions vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, stressful situations in life. So that's quite intuitive, I think. Everyone will, will accept that. And we know that we can, you know, train ourselves and other people in regulating their emotions. But when it comes to conflict, and mainly when it comes to political conflict, so for so many years, people said something like, why should we study emotions in conflict if we can't do anything about it? You know, emotions are such, you know, they're, they're almost like there was such a deterministic approach to emotion saying something like, you know, let's assume that we'll study it and we'll say that, I don't know, hatred drives violence or fear drives whatever. What can we do about it? And what I want to suggest and what, what our studies has, have been suggested, suggesting for, for almost a decade now is that if emotions can be regulated in an interpersonal or even intrapersonal context, they can also be regulated in a, in, a, in a political context. And if emotions are so important in driving people's 
you know, uh, 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 positions, attitudes, and behavior in political situations. And if we know, or if you already have strategies that can tell us how to effectively regulate or help people to regulate their emotions in, in you know, other domains in life, why can't we do it in the political domain as well? And, and what we've been showing in, in our studies is that when you help people or train people in regulating their emotions in these political or conflictual contexts, then they can, th their emotions can be changed. But also, maybe more importantly, their you know, political views and their political behavior can be changed in this, in this context as well. So, so we can use our deep understanding of emotional processes, not just as you know, external observers or researchers that can say you know, emotions are so important, but also using it in order to change reality in, 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 you know, in, in, in life. That's beautiful. And we'll explore, you know, later on the type of work that you're doing in terms of the emotion regulation interventions and how we can actually apply this research and hopefully make a change. Uh, so in terms of emotional climate and, you know, these uh, ideas of like a collective emotional orientation, how is it that a whole group of people can be, you know, almost possessed by certain emotions, especially when we're talking about intergroup conflict kind of contexts. I, I'll need like three or four hours to... to, to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. So, um, uh, but I'll try to do it in three minutes. But, but it's, sure. I, I don't get it. it's, it's such a fascinating, like, like you know... Uh, uh, phenomenon. So, so, you know, for many years, we thought when we thought about emotions, we said emotions is something really personal, right? It's, it's uh, one person experiencing a situation and feeling something internal. And, and, and that's, you know, something that it's very individualistic kind of psychological phenomenon. And I think that in recent years, you know, the, 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 the most, the, the clearest example of it is social media. You know, when you, when you, I don't know, when you, when you, when you, when you uh, look at your Twitter or your Facebook or whatever, and, and you see emotions spread so quickly after, you know, political or social events or situations, you realize at some point that emotions are not such an individualistic psychological phenomenon, but th there's something that's happening in the air or on, 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 on this social media outlet or, or, or whatever. And emotions go beyond individuals into groups. And I think that one of the most fascinating questions that we've been asking ourselves in recent years is, how do emotions spread? And what does it mean that an emotion can be experienced on the group level and not just on the individual level? And that's, that's a, you know, it's, it's a fascinating question because, you know, and maybe the most challenging thing is, is there such thing as, you know, as a group feeling an emotion. You know, I can say, you know, I'm angry. You can say, I, I hate someone. I love someone. Can we say that, I don't know, Israelis feel hopeful or Israelis feel, a, 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 I don't know, fear today as, as a group? What, 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 what exactly does it mean, right? And, and, and I think that now there are at least three or four different ideas about what does it mean to feel emotion as, as a collective. I'll, I'll do it very briefly. Stop me if I talk too much. No, that. no, please. Because, because I really find it fascinating. So, so the most basic idea is, 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 is based on work of, of uh, uh, Mackie and Smith in the early 90s, who talked about group-based emotions. And group-based emotions are emotions that people feel in the name of other people. So think, for example, on a situation in which, I don't know, I see a picture of an Israeli soldier mistreating a Palestinian woman in a roadblock, okay? And I feel guilt in the name of that person. Now, it's not empathy, because that person doesn't necessarily feel guilty, right? But I feel guilt in his name or in her name. 
And that's really interesting because I didn't experience this situation myself. I wasn't part of it. I cannot be directly responsible for what happened, but I feel guilty because this person is in a way, he's an extension of me, an extension of who I am. So if he's an extension of who I am, I can feel, I can feel an emotion, in this case, guilt, in his name. Now think about hundreds of thousands of people who feel an emotion in the name of a person or a group of people who are experiencing a certain event, right? And all of us are experiencing this emotion more or less the same time simultaneously, more or less in the same intensity. Now, can we say at this point that there's, there's a group level emotion that's happening here? I would say, yes, definitely. And it's a group level emotion because we feel the emotion in the name of others that are part of our group. And also because we feel that emotion together with many other people. Now here, there's, there's another point, which is, I, I find it fascinating. And you know, there's, there, there, uh, there, there are many studies led by Amit Goldenberg, who is a professor now at, at Harvard Business School and was my former student was basically showing that, you know, when people are responding to situations in life, but they're responding to situations in life together with many other people, what's happening is that there's some kind of an emergent emotional process that's happening there. Because what people, what, what, what's happening to people is that they're not just responding to the event, they're responding to an, some kind of an integrative perception of the event on the one hand and other people's emotional reaction to the event on the other hand. So if I'm sitting in a, with a group of people, okay, and something is happening that makes me angry to some extent, but then I see all others that are becoming really, really angry, my emotional response is not just to the event, it's to the event combined with the fact that all other group members feel right. really, really angry. And then there's something that's happening here that's, I mean, it's a group emotion, not just because we experience the emotion together, but because each and every individualistic emotional response is also driven by the combined or the aggregate of everyone else's response. So that's the second thing. And the last thing you, you mentioned, this idea of emotional climate, and here, right. I, I think that, you know, there's, there's a very, I can, I mean, instead of defining it, I can just give you an example. I can ask you this morning, you know, Ronnie, how are you this morning? And many people, you know, now in Israel with all the protests and the, you know, huge conflicts on the streets and everything that's happening around us, many people would, would say something like, you know, personally or individually, I feel great. On the collective level, you know... Uh, the feeling is not that amazing. Something like right, that. Right, right. I, I feel good, but how can I feel good right now? I can't really. And then you start talking about the situation. And then you start, but, but, but it also means that, you know, people feel something in the air. Right, right, right. right. It's not, and it's not just that. So, so people can say, I'm really happy this morning, but the emotional collective climate, climate is really negative. And then my individual happiness is probably also influenced in some way by the emotional climate. And, and in conflicts, I think that oftentimes the climate, the emotional climate is a climate of anxiety or a climate of hatred. So I don't feel fear on the individual level or anxious on the individual, individual level, but I know that that's what most of the people in my society feel in a certain time point. And that also has, it's like, you know, think about climate in the traditional sense. So I, I know what most people are feeling right now. So you can also think about it as an emotional climate. I know what most people are feeling right now, emotionally. Right, right. I think this, you know, idea of, you know, in its most basic form, emotional contagion, and just the fact that we we aren't operating in a vacuum, emotionally speaking. We're so susceptible to the emotions of the people around us. And 
we also, you know, learn about the world and understand, you know, what is a threat and what isn't a threat through other people's emotions as well. And I think, you know, just bringing this into the conversation, this idea that when you walk into a room and there is tension in the air, that's something you can feel, right? That's not something made up. That's not woo-woo. That, that really exists. And definitely, you know, in a culture, in a country, when all of the people are, you know, consuming the same media and we're all, you know, in immersed in the same narrative, we can definitely pick up on each other's emotions. And that kind of synchronization can really create, you know, what you call an emotional climate, which I, I love that term because it really, really hits home on how it's something that's in the air. We're immersed in it and it's not something you can separate yourself from. Um, and and I, think that I, I totally agree with everything that you said. And I think that, you know, one, one additional characteristic of societies in conflict is their level of, you know, cohesiveness and, and the fact that people believe that, you know, we must believe in the same things and we must feel the same right. way. And, and, and there's no room for, you know, deviants or no room for outliers that would challenge this society. And in a way, right. this, is, this is how these, these emotional, these group level emotions become a barrier in the face of any alternative information or any like new ideas that could have potentially maybe lead us to, 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 to even entertain ideas of how to resolve the conflict because everyone must feel fear or everyone must feel, hey, you know, we have studies that show that, you know, people are actively upregulating their levels of anxiety. So they don't really feel fear, but they, they realize that they have to feel fear if they want to be part of the group. So think about the implications of that, because it means that even, you know, the situation is, is, is scary enough objectively. But then if people feel like they need to upregulate their negative emotions in order to feel belong, to be part of the group, then it becomes an additional layer of barrier to maybe promote a different situation. Absolutely. And, you know, just in that example, feeling empathy for the other side would be a problem. You know, you wouldn't want to show that even if you do. Uh, so there are a lot of barriers here. I would love to zoom in to some of these emotions. You know, as we said, we have these discrete stories and narratives around the emotions, and they each play a different role when we're looking at intergroup conflicts. So, We'll we'll go over as much as we have time for, but I would love I would love to do a little bit of a deep dive here. So, in terms of hatred, it it's such a powerful emotion and it's unambiguous, right? What role does hatred play, and what appraisals uh, do you, have you found lead to hatred? What what helps perpetuate the hatred and would you say it's the most dominant emotion in these conflicts? Okay, so you asked like six questions. Ten questions, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm trying to pack them into to a single sentence for you. <laughs> the, 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 the positive side of it is that I can choose, right? I can answer only the questions I want to I answer. Go for it, go for it. You know, I started from studying hatred. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little bit ashamed to say, but for, for many years, people call me, you know, this is a run from the hatred. You know, you, you're oh, wow. <laughs> a hate guy, which is not a, which is not a great thing. But it doesn't, started, doesn't uh, characterize you at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I started from studying hatred specifically because I thought that hatred is, is, is the most destructive emotion. Mm -hmm. Now, I want, I want to distinguish between you asked if it's the most dominant emotion and my answer would be no. I don't think right. that hatred is the most dominant emotion, but it is definitely the most destructive emotion. So, so the distinction is that I don't think that most people hate. And I don't think that, 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 that hatred is the emotion with the highest intensity amongst, among most people. But when, when people hate, and among those who do hate, that's, I mean, it's a one-way trend. 
hatred is really the, mo the most destructive emotion. And hatred is the most destructive emotion, especially because of, you, know, you asked about its appraisals, and it's, it's, it's especially because of hatred appraisals. And, and hate is different from all other or most other negative emotions, mostly like anger, fear, and other emotions, because when people hate, their emotion is not targeted at a specific behavior. They don't hate what, what the outgroup is doing, or what the outgroup did to them. They hate the outgroup itself. And that's very, very, very critical, a very critical point. So you can be angry, Israelis can be angry because Palestinians, I don't know, uh, 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 said something wrong about them. Okay? Or they can be, they can feel fear because Palestinians threatened to shoot missiles at Tel Aviv. Okay? But these emotions are targeted at specific actions. But Israelis would hate, not the specific actions, they would hate the Palestinians as a whole. And that's a very, very problematic thing because when you hate an outgroup, you're basically saying they're all the same and I hate them because who they are and not because what they do. And I hate them because they're, I don't know, they're immoral or, or violent or racist by nature or by culture. And this cannot be changed. And, 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 and hatred is, so, is, is such a negative emotion or emotion with such negative implications because, and again, it's very rational. Because if you believe that what they do to you or what they did to you is a result of who they are and they're immoral or evil by nature, the only reasonable implication is that you have to either distance yourself from them or destroy them, right? You can't change them. You can't improve their behavior. You can't negotiate with them. It doesn't make sense to offer them any gestures or to be open to their new ideas because they will never, never change, okay? You know, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I had a very, very racist grandmother. Okay, she already passed away, but and and when I tried to convince her that maybe we should, you know, we should negotiate with Palestinians, with, and she always told me, Iran, don't teach me. You know, I know that <laughs> we never, never change. I mean, you turn your back to them, they'll stab you in the back. Okay, that's that's the whole idea of hatred, like saying they will never change, no matter what we'll do, they will never change. And and think about it. It undermines the whole idea of conflict resolution or the whole idea of democracy, right? Because the whole idea of democracy or conflict resolution is, you know, we want to bring to the table new ideas, we want to negotiate, we want to make some compromises, we believe in some, you know, reciprocal processes, and hatred blocks everything. Because hatred right. means nothing can be changed. And this is why hatred is so destructive. destructive. I think, you know, just making that, first of all, one of the points that you made is that we don't all hate, which I'm uh, comforted in hearing. And, you know, making that distinction between hatred and anger and and showing how, you know, and I, I would love for you to say more about anger in a bit, but just seeing how, you know, hatred really doesn't lead to anything positive. You know, you can't negotiate, you can't reconcile, you you can't see the humanity in the other side. It's really blinding in that sense. And I'm also comforted by the fact that it isn't the dominant emotion, right? That's not what people are carrying with them necessarily, um, you know, in a collective manner. So you have found that anger is very dominant. In I want to stop you for, for one second. Just Please to, do. Please do. <laughs> Sorry. You know, as an Israeli, I, I can be impolite sometimes, right? Yes, it's, yes, it's, you it's can. Very, very <laughs> natural. I mean, uh, uh, but it can no, be... No, please, please. If you have, if you have any uh, adjustments to what I said, please feel just, free. Just a very small adjustment. Uh, uh, you said something like, uh, there, I mean, there's, there are no positive implications for hatred. Okay. What? Well, okay. It's adaptive. I, I, I it's adaptive. Say, in certain situations. I mean, some people would say, and I, I, I at least partially agree with them, that if an emotion exists, then there's, then there's a reason for that. And, 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 and I'll, I'll give you like two examples for things that are positive implications of hatred. 
One is hatred can be very positive in terms of people's like positive self-image and group cohesion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we know that, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing to say, but, but empirically it's true. So sometimes hate is positively associated with, you know, people's well-being. You know, because, because it gives them meaning, right? And so, so, so it's, not, it's not as if it doesn't have any functional, you know, aspects. It does. Right. I saw, I saw this meme online about couples and that, you know, one of the ways they bond is by going to a dinner party and then just hating on everyone on the drive back home. <laughs> and that is, that is the source of the greatest bonding yeah. sometimes. It so, <laughs> you know, if that's what you need to improve, yeah, you know, it's a great... Whatever <laughs> works. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's one thing. And, and, and the second thing that I would say is that I can think of very, very, very extreme situations in which the appraisals that I've described regarding hatred are actually rooted in objective facts in reality, right? I mean, I don't know if there's, a, you know, a, a psychopath who is doing terrible things to people, okay? And it cannot be changed. And it's rooted in his, you know, personality and... and so hatred is justified. So doing everything you can to distance yourself, I, I don't say, you know, kill him, but, but do everything you can to distance yourself from that person. That's probably the most adaptive, you know, uh, 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 action tendency that, that, that's driven by hatred. So hatred in that part is adaptive. And if you take it to the intergroup domain, if there are very, very, very radical religious groups, that their very, very fundamental ideology is to destroy and annihilate other groups, then hating them can, can be justified some, sometimes and can be the most reasonable and adaptive response. So again, I would say in 99% of the cases, you're right. But there's one, 1% in which I would, I, I, I would think about it differently. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's important, you know, when we're talking about these things, sometimes just the the hopeful wishing and kind of really picturing uh, a world that you wish existed. But honestly, you know, as you said, at the root of hatred could also be objective moral judgments. And when things, and I think that is important, you know, to to be able to identify what your values are and to draw the line in terms of what you don't agree with mm-hmm. that's also an important you know human ability so there is a distinction between hatred and anger in this case and anger is more specific in terms of the event right and a certain action and not the entire character of a people so can you tell us how anger is involved in intergroup conflicts? So, so, so I think, first of all, you started with the most important point. So, so anger is about a specific event. And mm-hmm. people, and anger is very, very, very common in intergroup conflict. And it's very common because of its narrative. And the narrative is that, you know, the other group or the other people have done to us something that shouldn't have been done because it's unfair, it's immoral, we do not deserve such behavior. Think about violent conflicts or any intergroup conflicts. In most cases, people believe that their group behaved properly. Our group, we always wanted peace. We offered them everything. We tried to give them, you know, to offer gestures or be, you know, whatever. And this is the way they treat us. And this is what we get in return. That's exactly the, you know, the platform for anger. But anger is not about the group or the person. It's not, I, I'm not angry at them. I'm angry at the action or the behavior of the group. And it also means that anger is all about correction. It's about, I mean, when you feel angry, think, think about your, 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 your you know, interpersonal relation. You know, I'm angry at my kids because they did something wrong. But, but I'm angry at them because I, I, I believe that they did something wrong. 
and I should somehow correct their wrongdoing or their wrong behavior, right? But I believe that it's possible. If I hadn't believed that it's possible, I wouldn't feel angry. Angry is about, there's a lot of, you know, the sense of agency and control right. is very high in, in, when people are angry. They believe that they can correct the wrongdoing. Now, when you translate it to conflict, so oftentimes, you, you know, people associate anger with aggression. And, and it's true. So if you feel that someone did something really wrong to you and you want to correct the wrongdoing and you feel like you have the power to do that, oftentimes the immediate you know, behavioral response would be an aggressive response. And we know that oftentimes in conflicts, violent policies or violent actions are driven by anger. But we should keep in mind that these violent actions that are driven by anger are aimed at improving the situation and not necessarily by our motivation just to destroy the outcome. And, and, and we have some studies showing that very, I think, very interestingly and, and, and some, you know, to some extent counterintuitively, that anger leads to, you know, our motivation to correct the wrongdoing. And this can be translated either to more aggressive policies or to more conciliatory policies. So people who feel angry are also people who really want to talk to the other side and are willing to take risks because they feel powerful. Okay, and are willing to some, you know, to 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 invest time and 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 even resources in educating the other side because they truly believe that change is possible. And in this sense, you know, anger is almost the the other side of hate. If hate is all about my belief that nothing good can happen, anger is about the belief that I can change the situation for the good. And that's, that's very, very different. Right, right. You know, I've heard anger uh, be defined as the healthy defense of boundaries, you know, and I think that really goes to what you're saying of there is an event, there is a certain behavior that I disagree with, that I want to change, but believing that it can be changed, believing that there should and can be, you know, a better situation and hatred in that sense is hopeless, right? There, you don't see any potential, right? Yeah, and also, and also, there is a difference between the two in the, in the sense that in hatred, each and every negative behavior of the outgroup reflects on the nature of the outgroup. So they committed a terror attack because that's the way they are, right? And in anger, you say, you know, they committed a terror attack. Okay, they, they made a mistake. They did something wrong. And uh, maybe con some something in, in, in the in the context of the situation right now led them to do that. They can change their behavior. And and but it doesn't reflect on who they are inherently. Once these actions start to you know to aggregate and to reflect on who we think that the outgroup is, then anger can be transformed into hatred. Because it's no longer, I'm no longer angry on what they did. I hate who they are. Right, right. Now, another very important emotion when we're talking about intergroup conflicts is fear. And fear might not be, you know, as powerful as anger, but it's all consuming, right? It really permeates every facet of our lives. So how does fear come into play here? And how does it motivate us uh, to change or derail, you know, our reconciliation uh, attempts? Yeah, fear, fear is, is, is fascinating. And fear is, is probably, I mean, if I had to choose, I would say probably fear is, is the most dominant emotion. Mm -hmm. So because, because in, in many ways, you know, conflicts are about fear. Because, because they are about threats, because they are about, you know, there, there's no conflict without a very, very, very basic or fundamental disagreement or competition over specific resources or ideas or values. And then it's all about threat. 
you know, and, 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 and then the threat is amplified and fear becomes anxiety and, 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 it's, and, 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 and really there's no conflict without threat and no conflict without, without fear. And I think that the most, you know, the, the most important implication of fear on people's behavior is that they become very, very, very defensive. And becoming defensive means that the only goal that you see is security. If I feel threatened existentially or a very, very basic threat to my values, the only thing I want to achieve or the main thing I want to achieve, I want to feel secure because that's the most basic need that human beings have, right? And that means that I don't, I won't take any risk in looking, you know, outside of the box for new ideas, new opportunities, explore different options. My main and maybe only priority is to feel safe. And if, if, if my main and my only priority is to feel safe, I invest whatever I have in security, okay? People's education, budget, like everything is invested in, 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 in security. And that's probably the most reasonable thing to do. You know, fear is a very, very, very rational emotion. I think that the challenge with fear is that the same thing that helps us in protecting ourselves when the threat is so high is the thing that prevents us from identifying opportunities when the threat lowers down a, a little bit. And that's the challenge because fear is adaptive as long as the objective threat is really there. I think that the tragedy of societies in conflict is that the very, very high level of fear prevent them from identifying more nuanced situations. And that's the right. Threat. Yes, I think that, you know, you do make this distinction between uh, objective threats and perceived threats. And there, and those threats could also be realistic, physical threats, and they can also be symbolic towards, you know, the group's identity. So all of these things come into play. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about um, fear on the individual level, when somebody is constantly fearful, we call that, you know, hypervigilance. And we know that they're you know, entire perception is biased by this fear and they're very quick to respond and to perceive threats even when they aren't there. So that's definitely something mm -hmm. that we see in these kinds of conflicts on a collective level. I think that there, there, there are actually two things that are, are happening and, and are very, very much associated with what you said. The first one is sensitivity to any threat like indication in, in the reality. And you see that, you know, no matter if you're the high power or the low power group in conflict, the most the, the, the thing that you're most sensitive about is, is threat in your in your environment. And the second thing is that people who feel fear or that are dominated by fear tend to what we call freeze cognitively. So cognitive freezing is probably the most dominant you know, cognitive characteristic of societies in conflict. And, and, and they freeze on their very, very, very initial, you know, perceptions or appraisals of the conflict. And it's very, very, very difficult for them to unfreeze. And this is in, in many ways what, 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 what create this, you know, situation in which you simply cannot consider any other options. Maybe, maybe one, one more thing to say about fear and, and, and to make it a little bit more hopeful, is that yeah. at the end of the day, when people feel fear, you know, the, 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 the emotional goal is always driven by the appraisal. And if the appraisal is that, you know, there is serious threat, I want to reduce the threat. And the emotional goal is, I want to do anything possible in life to reduce that, that threat. So there are many ways to reduce the threat. And you can do it through, you know, more aggressive reaction, or you can do it through peace or conflict resolution. And that's a very, very important point. I think that, you know, one of the most important and, 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 and tra tragic, I think, failures 
of societies in conflict is that oftentimes they associate fear and threat with aggressive tendencies. Whereas when you, when you think about it more deeply, you know, about the psychological construct of fear, people just want to feel secure. They only want to feel secure. So people who want to promote peace or conflict resolution in this context, one of their main challenges is to create a much closer association between threat reduction on, one, on the one hand and peace process or conflict resolution on the other hand. In other, in other words, if I can convince people that the best way for them to feel secure is to make very serious compromises, but then to live in peace, then fear would be associated with more conciliatory tendencies. And, and we have some studies that support this notion. Right. So I would love, you know, just in uh, respect of your time, I do I would love to talk about the emotion regulation studies that you guys have done. And, you know, leave us with a hopeful message in terms of how can we understand these different emotions and, you know, use them and regulate them in ways where we can associate them, as you said, with motivating people into more uh, conciliatory uh, directions. Okay, so th that's a great question. I think that the, 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 the best thing that I can do to answer this question uh, uh, briefly would be to give you like just the, you know, the highlights of, sure, um, sure. of the studies on, on emotion regulation. And then if people would be more curious, then they, they, can, they can read or, or, or get, delve more deeply into this, this idea. So the very basic idea, as, as I said before, is that, you know, if we can help regulate people in regulating their emotions in other contexts, Let's try to do it also in the context of conflicts. And if, if emotions are so important in driving people's like, actions in conflict, then helping them in regulating their emotions in conflict should also be translated into changing their like, policy tendencies in, the, in this context. And I'll mention four different things that we've done in recent years. And I'll also give credit to the people who were you know, collaborators in the, on, the, on this project. So... The first thing that we've done and was all already replicated in many other conflicts, not just in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, is we used the classic, the most well-established emotion regulation like tactic, which is called cognitive reappraisal. Basically, cognitive reappraisal is, is training people in, you know, when they feel very intense emotions, we help them to take an external perspective on the situation to think about the situation from very different angles, not necessarily from the angle of the other side, but from an external perspective, like a scientist who's looking at it from the other side, and then the emotions can be reduced. And, and, and we've done that in many, many studies in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, both directly training their people in, in more effectively regulating their emotion through reappraisal, but also, for example, through a, a, a smartphone app that we've developed that help people in, 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 in doing cognitive reappraisal. And in all of these studies, what we've showed is that when people are regulating their emotions in response to real-life conflict situations, when they're doing it, when they're effectively doing cognitive reappraisal, their negative emotions, anger, hatred, are reduced, and then their support for more conciliatory policies is increased, not just immediately, but also six and seven months later, after they were trained in like 10 or 15 minutes, like training of emotion regulation. These studies were done in collaboration with James Gross, Maya Tamir, Ronnie Parat, and, and, and others. And I think that there's, there's a promise here about you know things that you can do maybe to change the reality in, in, in conflict situations, but also serious challenges. And there are serious challenges because you know, can is it really scalable? Can you really go like person by person and trying to regulate? I mean, there, there's a huge challenge here, but at least there's some kind of I call it like you know, it's a, like a proof of concept. Like right. we can do that, it can happen. 
in, in follow-up studies, mainly led by Ronnie and, and Maya Tamir, we show that sometimes you don't even need to train people in, in, the, in, the, in the emotion regulation strategy. All you need to do is to motivate them to regulate their emotions. So, for example, in some of these studies, all we did was to convince people that it would be, would be great for them to down-regulate their anger. And then they, they, all, they, they found a way to do that. So we didn't even have to provide them with the emotion regulation strategy. We only motivate them, motivated them to down-regulate their, their emotions, and it already, already happened. And again, we, we, we showed effects on, on their actual emotions and political tendencies, even days and weeks after the emotion regulation training. One of the most exciting things that we've been doing these days, and this is also led by Amit Goldenberg that I mentioned before, is to examine, I mean, the question of how do you do emotion regulation in groups? So, for example, we're asking ourselves these days, let's assume that you have a group of 20 people. Is it enough to train two of them in regulating their emotions in response to conflict you know, related situations, and then they will, you know, influence the others. So how many people do you need to train in order for, for a group to respond differently to a, to a conflict-related situation? And what we show is that you don't need so many people to regulate their emotions in order for an entire group to go through such a transformation. That's, that's fascinating. But, but again, I would say the study of, of emotion regulation in, in conflict situations is, is still in its very, very initial, like baby steps, and, and there's still so many things to, to be done there. I think that, you know, as a proof of concept, as you called it, it's a really, you know, important message and a very hopeful one. And tying back to what we said before on back that emotions and emotional barriers are really at the heart of a lot of these conflict and our inability to reconcile and see political issues as, you know, more than just political issues. And I think knowing that being able to regulate our emotions, whether we motivate people to regulate, whether we teach them how to regulate, or whether it's just a few people, but knowing that you as an individual do have an effect on your group I think that's a really, really powerful message. So I love this research and I really appreciate, you know, the work that you've been doing and the hopeful message that you're sending out into the world. So thank you, Iran. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Thank you, Iran. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>